Well, good evening to you. Uh, I want to say welcome to our D6 uh, lesson time uh, for July 19th. We are still in our special topics unit entitled True Religion. And um, our family theme, again, is that we are to uh, rely on God's justice. And of course, those of you that watched our service today via live stream or you were in the service, remember that we preach from this passage today. Uh, I, I spoke on God's justice and how we can count on it. And um, I hope that you were encouraged and challenged. If you've not been able to go back and watch uh, the sermon uh, today, the service, I trust that you will. Um, we talked about uh, today, and I want to remind you that uh, Nahum, uh, one of the minor prophets, it's if you'd like to take your Bible and turn there, or you have your lesson outlined that we emailed to you, uh, Nahum is a, a minor prophet right after, um, in the Bible, right after Micah and right before Habakkuk is where you'll find uh, the writing. And he would be the prophet that declared to Nineveh that God would demonstrate his justice uh, by bringing wrath and rebellion, uh, or wrath and um uh, his judgment on the rebellious people, uh, but he would also balance that with understanding, helping us to understand that God is always willing to uh, be uh, gracious and give deliverance uh, to those who are faithful and who will trust him. God always does what is right and what is just, and um, we have a responsibility as God's people to do our very best to live right, to do right, and also to warn uh, about God's justice uh, and the fact that it includes not only judgment, but also grace. And so I want you to think this morning before we get into Nahum 1, chapter 1, I just want to, um, I want you to think about something. Maybe write this down on the top of your outline. Life is not fair. And I want you to think about uh, time, a time in your life, or maybe many times in your life, when you believe that uh, truly that you were treated unfairly, uh, maybe by a punishment that you received by a teacher or even your parents, and um, or a, you were uh, disciplined for something that someone else did, uh, which would certainly be unfair. Or how many times? Did you say, did you hear your kids say, life's just not fair? And, and you would let them know and try to teach them that sometimes life, uh, as we live in this fallen world, is not fair. And so today we're going to see how God is always just and, and righteous, both in his judgment and in his mercy. And I think a question that we should ask in light of the current climate in our nation right now is, is it possible for us to show both justice and mercy in our society. And what would it look like? And we're going to see how God was able to do both as he dealt with his people. And so one of the things that uh, we understand, and if you if you have your outline, it's the Fusion Teaching Essential Outline uh, that, that was with the email. I hope you'll take it out and follow along. Uh, revenge seems built into our personalities. I, I want to, I, I want someone to pay them back, or I'm going to pay them back for the wrong that they did me. Or, uh, and and so because it is in us many times in our fallen nature, uh, it pours into our uh, culture. Um, movies such as Gladiator and Unforgiven, if you remember those, and The Searchers. Uh, those are movies, literature, including the, the Iliad and Hamlet. Uh, getting even with others is often viewed as justice. But I want you to be assured that uh, revenge is not justice. Self-will, bitterness, and evil motives prompt revenge. Yet justice finds its roots in God's righteous nature, and there is a difference. It is based on an innate sense of right and wrong because God created us in his image. And I think we need to remember that. Uh, even non-Christians have some notion of justice. 
They may disagree as believers sometimes do as well over exactly what is right and what is wrong, but people believe that right should receive praise and wrong should receive penalty. And so these expressions of reward and punishment played out in the city of Nineveh. It was the capital of the ancient nation of Assyria, and it was over 600 years before Jesus was born. And a hundred years earlier, as I reminded them in the message today, a um, hundred years earlier, Nineveh had repented of its sin when Jonah went to preach there. And But by Nahum's time, they had turned back to their old ways of evil and brutality and idolatry. And the brutality of Assyrian conquest is legendary. Um, I didn't share this this morning, but their warriors flayed the skin off of captives and impaled enemies on stakes. They cut off their limbs. They burned them in fire. They would put out their eyes and committed really horrific, abusive acts. And so the Lord sent the prophet Nahum to declare his intent to bring down Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire. And their own sin prompted a righteous and just God to return their wickedness upon them. And in doing so, he gives us a warning as well. And so when we dis disregard the Lord's mercy, he will deal with us uh, in, in his justice. And so the first thing we want to remember, uh, if you look in, in verses one, uh, starting in verse one, it says the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth, the Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. If you look down at verse three in the latter part, it says, the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds of the dust of his feet. You look in verse six and it says, who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. And then of course, verses eight through 12, but with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof and darkness shall pursue his enemies. What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. And verse 14, <clears throat> Nahum goes on to say, and the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thy grave for thou art vile. And so the Lord displays his justice in bringing uh, his wrath upon the rebellious um, Assyrians. And so, uh, you know, Nahum recorded an oracle about the city of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. And we know no other details about him other than his name and that he was from Elkosh. Perhaps it was a city in Judah or Galilee region uh, or what is now Iraq. And so he told the coming fall of the city and keep in mind that a hundred years earlier, Jonah had called Nineveh to repent. And of, of course, as the years passed, they went right back into their, um, their old ways. And the question opening verse six further explained that no one will escape God's anger towards sin unless they trust him for mercy. And so verses six, eight, and nine describe that devastation of what was to come to Nineveh. The city would be broken down, it'd be burned, it'd be overrun by the Mede and Babylonian armies and completely destroyed. And so thorough was the destruction um, that when the Greek historian Xenophon passed through the area in 401 BC, he saw no trace of Nineveh. In fact, excavators um, 
Excavators have determined that the battle over the city lasted for months and the enemy looted temples and burned the royal place. Fighting was house to house and in the streets. And of course, verse, verse 12 renders the summary verdict on Nineveh's fall. Uh, the Lord's vengeance cut down the city and she passed into history's night. And so, um, you know, it goes back to where, you know, he says, uh, affliction shall not rise up the second time. And so as Jonah once preached mercy to Nineveh, now Nahum preached Yahweh's judgment on the same city. And so when we know that's how God's character, um, uh, you know, deals with people and nations, we need to speak up for what is right. And we need to trust God to justly dispense with evil and evildoers as he will. Uh, as he wills to do. Um, we need to resist the appeal today, even with in certain aspects of Christianity, to overlook the hard questions about God's righteousness and judgment while we focus on his love and kindness. We must preach and teach uh, both, uh, not just focus on love and kindness. You know, when you go over to Jude and he, he's talking about how some will be rescued he says, some you will save with compassion, but others uh, pulling them from the fire. And, and it sort of gives me the idea that what Jude was saying is there are going to be some that, you know, we show compassion and mercy and we preach the love of God and his kindness and they will respond. But we also see that there'll be some you pull from the fire when you talk to them about God's righteousness and his mercy and, and his indignation toward uh, sin. And so, you know, how do we stand for right? Well, we speak up against sin and not the person. We don't personalize this. We know people uh, just like us are committing the sin, but we speak up against the sin, uh, not the person. Explain uh, that a just and righteous God warns evildoers that he must punish wrongdoing. And so while God does love people, he cannot tolerate sin. And so that's how we warn people. And then, you know, how is God's wrath on sin actually justice? That's another good question we must ask. And we just need to remember that sin is rebellion against God and what is right. And his righteous judgment, uh, his righteous punishment brings justice. And so he's not doing anything but what is in his character to do when he uh, punishes uh, sin and brings justice to a situation, an individual, a group of people, even a church or a nation. And so the second thing we find is in the latter part of verse three, down through verse five, it says, the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and dryeth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and, the Car and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. And so we can witness, we can observe the Lord's justice through his power at work in the natural world. Um, you know, the Old Testament mentions a number of occasions when God worked through nature to accomplish his will. Um, Noah's flood in Genesis 6 through 9, the plagues of Egypt in Exodus 7 through 12, uh, Numbers 22 when the donkey spoke, uh, the sun standing still at Gibeon in Joshua chapter 10, the flooding at the uh, brook Kishon in uh, Judges 5, the drought in Elijah's day where God used Elijah there, the fish and Jonah and the locust plague and Joel, and that's just to name a few. And so here, since God's justice flows from his righteous character, he takes the reins in rewarding right behavior and punishment uh, and punishing wickedness. And according to these verses, one of the ways he works his justice into his plan is through nature. Uh, just as God controls the moral and the spiritual realms uh, to do his will, he also uses the arena of nature to accomplish his just purposes. In fact, Nahum uses striking word pictures to, to describe divine power at work. He uses the wind, the storm, the clouds, the drought, the floods, mountains quaking and rocks breaking and uh, the earth shaking. And verse eight mentions the overwhelming flood of God's complete judgment on Nineveh. And um, it really is emphasizing the devastation of the city. 
uh, it, it too can have some literal overtones. In fact, history tells us that the Tigris River was indeed at such a surging flood stage uh, that its waters rose nearly to the top of the city walls in 612 BC. And, um, and, and so God sometimes uses the natural forces uh, of those things he created to reveal um, his righteous dealings with people and their nations. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we need to, to remember that. And yet uh, creation itself turns in his hand uh, when he uses it to show uh, his justice. And so we need to recognize God's sovereign power and righteousness that are evident in his authority over created order and the moral realm. He controls the storms. He controls the quakes. He can stop a storm. We saw that several times in scripture. And so Jesus showed divine uh, power over nature when he stilled the storm on the Sea of Galilee. And, and think about this. Pause for a moment to confess that Jesus rules your life that same way, this very moment, and trust his authority um, by being obedient to him. Trust his authority in your life. Um, you know, some of the things that come to mind, do, do you think God speaks to us or to the world today in general through natural disasters, um, storms, floods, earthquakes? Uh, we can't be sure for each specific event, but we, we, and we, got, we have to be careful about making those claims. But we need to observe um, these natural disasters and ask the Lord and, and, and I, you know, try to be discerning. Lord, are you trying to speak to us? Um, you know, view and uh, observe and, um, you know, take stock and inventory of where you are spiritually and where we are as a nation. And just, you know, think about the possibilities about God using some of those things uh, to, wake us up spiritually and to get our attention. And then what do we learn from observing, uh, you know, how God works through the, you know, these natural um, events and these natural created things? Well, we just simply are reminded that God is full of power and glory and creativity and beauty. And he can even use those things uh, to work his justice uh, in our, on our behalf and in our lives. And then the last thing, we, we read the first part of verse three, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Um, and, and verse seven, it says, the Lord is good, uh, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trusteth in him. Uh, we see verse 12 uh, in the latter part of that verse, though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. And for now will I break his yoke from off thee and will burst thy bonds in sunder. And then verse 15, he says, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. And so we learn here that God shows his justice in offering his love to a sinful world. Even though God brought doom upon the Assyrian capital and the entire nation, the act of judgment meant deliverance for his own people, Israel. The same Lord who punishes also saves. And Nahum painted the side of the picture beginning in verse three. And after describing the righteous vengeance of the Lord upon Nineveh, he added that the same God is also forgiving and long suffering and gracious. You know, he also, um, uh, he also pointed out that the Lord was good. You know, God, Yahweh, God never sets aside his goodness, even in the midst of judgment. His wrath upon those uh, who refuse his grace magnifies that grace even more. He never deals with anyone unjustly, whether he sends punishment or deliverance. And God is both right and good. And his grace uh, means that he is a fortress in the midst of judgment. And those who turn to him have nothing to fear. God saved the people of Israel. And ladies and gentlemen, he will still save those today who trust him. And we must get that message out. And what a time we're living in to try to get people's attention, to listen to the message of God's judgment and his grace. 
You know, God's often compared to a fortress or a stronghold. And these were secure positions that were often elevated and offered safety during a time of warfare. And we see that in, in uh, Psalm 18 and 27 and 91 and Isaiah 25 and Jeremiah 16. Um, and so, you know, Nahum's opening prophecy reached a crescendo with a closing oracle of salvation. And, and we need to be thankful for that. Um, the, the, Greek word, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, uses the, the word that in English is the root behind evangelize that brings good news. It's the word to look or behold, and it sets up that drama. Um, joyful worship was going to be restored, and the Lord is fulfilling his covenants with his people as they once more fulfill their promises to him. And ultimately, this restored salvation awaits fulfillment in Christ. Uh, in fact, Isaiah 52, 7 tells a similar story of a messenger who arrives with good news, the gospel of salvation from the king who reigns in Zion. And so these are messianic um, uh, you know, foretellings of, uh, of Jesus coming and being the uh, proclaimer of good news. And then we may say, well, how, how does that apply? If we see all of this wrath and indignation against sin, and now we're saying that God, in the same way, you know, how do we, how do we sort of, in the same way, <clears throat> brings uh, graciousness and forgiveness and hope and love? We need to understand that God is still just and righteous when he offers mercy to sinners uh, because he is being true to his nature. Uh, Nahum 1.7 really stands out as one of the great declarations of assurance in the Bible. Uh, believe, what is, um, believe what God is. He is good. He's a stronghold. Believe what he does. He, he takes uh, intimate care of his people. And what we must do is hide ourselves, uh, put ourselves in his care every day, especially uh, those worst kind of days when we're going through things that are, are so unnormal and unexplainable. And so how can God be both just and merciful when it comes to people's sin? Well, Jesus paid the penalty for our sin, so God, uh, the Lord God can be merciful uh, to us when we trust in Christ. And then here's a question that, that we don't really have an answer to. You have to answer this within your own heart. Does your attitude toward people and confrontations incline toward justice or toward mercy? And then ask yourself why. Can we have both? Should we have both? Absolutely. But God always offers. Remember, God did not just offer justice. God did not just allow justice to be played out long before he brought his justice and, and um, interjected his judgment. He gave opportunities for mercy and grace and repentance and wanted them <clears throat> to do what was right and submit to him. Um, and so what does your attitude speak? Or do you lean more toward justice? Do you lean more toward mercy? Do you, um, do you have a good balance of both? And so you can use uh, some of the handouts to talk further about that. Um, you know, ask some questions like, what are some examples of how God has used the forces of nature to judge and punish sin? Uh, could God use um, natural disasters as judgment? Uh, are they always a tool of God's judgment? Uh, how can we find good balance which is what we should be doing is finding good balance when we discuss the topic with others. And, and then how can God offer mercy to sinners and still be righteous and holy and just? And, and then here is one that sometimes I, I think we're willing to ask those other questions, but here's one that really hits home. With whom could you share this good news with this week? Who in your life could you share this message that you've learned today? And I wanna encourage you to complete your daily devotions, to ponder this thought of God's justice and mercy and, and both being able to be <clears throat> accomplished. And I hope um, that you will examine your own attitude about 
um, showing mercy and justice, but also standing up for what's right, being holy, and making sure that you um, you you are obedient to the word of God and to God's uh, demand for us to be holy uh, as he is holy. Um, before I close today, uh, I want to do something I haven't done. First of all, today's July 19th, and I want to say uh, happy birthday to uh, birthdays that have been in July that we know about. Uh, Jenny Coke uh, birthday was July 4th. Pam Howe was the 6th. Ralph Howe was the 18th. Gary Lee is the 18th. Michelle Johnson is the 21st. Lawrence Brandon is the 26th. And Johnny Weeks is the 31st. And so we say happy birthday to all of you in the month of July. And then our July anniversaries is Nick and Karen Longcar are the 11th. And Jacques and Corinne Curitan is the 13th. And I know Jacques and Corinne are down in Florida now. But if you guys are tuned in, happy anniversary, happy anniversary to Nick and Karen. Uh, just want to remind you that our national convention starts tomorrow. Um, and um, want you to uh, tune in if you can, nafwb.org, O-R-G, and go in there tonight, first thing in the morning, check out the schedule and uh, be praying for uh, Dr. Barnes and all the other general board members, as for the first time in 85 years, we've had to allow the, we, we are allowing the um, general board to conduct the business, uh, but you can uh, participate and there'll be some uh, explanation there how you can do that. And we look forward to uh, the national convention. It was supposed to start today uh, in Oklahoma City and it, we were not able to go this year and uh, we're not able to have it in person. And so I trust that you'll be praying for our online convention and um, be praying for our church, be praying for our school. Uh, we are having lots of inquiries about students, be praying for our church families. I know you are, many of you are maybe discouraged over the, the, um, the mandates and the suggestions by our government and whether to wear a mask, whether not to wear a mask, your safety, your health, uh, the shutdowns, all those kind of things. Please know that God is in control. God knows where we are. He knows what we're suffering uh, uh, with and, and struggling with. And I trust that you'll, you'll just turn all those things over to him, rest in him, uh, knowing, and, and the way we do that is remember his character, he is sovereign. He is in control. None of this has caught him by surprise. And so just trust him and, and go about doing those things that you know is right. And, and I believe he'll honor you for that. I'm going to pray with you. And then I look forward to seeing you at our meeting to discuss bylaws on Wednesday evening. And I hope that you can come out at 630 if at all possible. So let's pray together and then uh, we will see you soon. Okay. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your word again. We thank you for the emphasis on your justice and yet also on your mercy and grace. You certainly extend love and hope uh, and you are long suffering in times of rebellion and disobedience. But Lord, we know that you come to a place where you can no longer uh, be long suffering towards sin and, and, and that your justice will prevail. And so we trust you. We thank you for our people. We thank you for those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this month. We also thank you for uh, our general board uh, there at the convention, uh, in the online convention, and be with Dr. Barnes and the other members as they uh, intently listen and, and do the business of our denomination. I pray that people will tune in to watch and that people will be encouraged by what they see. And we just ask that you'd be with us as we meet Wednesday night, that you'd give us clarity and understanding that you'd give us all a good attitude and a good spirit and that together we would work together uh, for that we would work to bring about the best good uh, for your work here at Great Bridge Free Will Baptist Church. We love you and thank you and thank you for this Lord's Day in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you all. Hope you have a great evening. Uh, I hope you get to spend some time with your family and have a great night's rest. We love you. Been praying for you. And uh, let us know if there's anything we can do to serve you. God bless.